You know, it's the mark of a friend when you recognize that uh, a friend of yours has faults, but you you either ignore them, you move past them, or you pump the other person up. I've known Sam Amick for uh, well over a decade now, and I consider him a real friend. Um, but, you know, Sam kind of crossed the line about a week ago. The Sloan Sports Conference takes place in Boston. Some of the best minds, if not all of the best minds, in the sport together. And two of my, well, one at least, my favorite journalists and Sam were on stage doing a live podcast in front of, again, some of the most intelligent people in the game. Sam was on with Howard Beck, and he brought my name up at one point. And somebody sent this to me and went, oh, my ears perked up. Oh, Sam's going to say something nice about me. Well, listen for yourself. A long time ago, this is a random story, but I wrote a thing about a Sacramento radio man. I think you know him, Carmichael Dave. Yes. And for years since then, it was in the context of a Ron Artest profile that I wrote. And Ron used to go on the radio with Dave and do radio things. And I described Dave as having a cushy poker player's build. And that is what (laughs) Jokic has. I mean, he doesn't look like a pro athlete. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam, for dragging me in front of Howard Beck, who you might have heard laugh. Howard Beck, also a local guy, made big. And the entire audience. Now, when they think of Carmichael Dave, they think, well, cushy poker player, Bill. In other words, big fatty. Carmichael Dave's debut at the Sloan Sports Conference, big fatty. Welcome in. Fatty Dave. But you know what? We got to be pros. So we'll get through this somehow, and I will be the bigger man here, Kyle. Yeah, we know. Okay, I'm not harping on this whatsoever. <laughs> Sam Amon joins us. Good morning, Sam, you fine-looking young man with a beautiful family and an excellent job and a great mind behind all of that. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing good. Kyle, well played. Dave, you. You, you should be the bigger man. You're used to it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think, you know, I think, uh, first of all, I I had somebody tell me lately, you okay, buddy? Yeah, I'm fine. You just, I didn't expect that. Go ahead. I wasn't laughing at you. <laughs> it's not funny. I <laughs> I had somebody ask me lately who didn't know me very well. They said, did you grow up uh, Catholic? And I said, yeah, my mom was Catholic. And they said, oh, you, you got a little bit of a, like a Catholic guilt thing going on. And so <laughs> the Catholic guilt was washing over me. As uh, as I listened to that, uh, a couple things. For one, you said now, you know, this is great when they think of Carmichael Bay. Rest assured, they they just won't. That's, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that will not be a topic of debate. Uh. I think you're safe. And then and then lastly, you, you kind of highlighted the idea, and I agree that you know we just kind of learn our our friends' faults. Um, I'm going to just own another one. I think I clearly have a complex of not of being passive aggressively, not nice to people in this type of way. Uh, Cause last night I went to the Kings game and, and a thought crossed my mind as I ran into Bobby Jackson. Um, I wrote a story recently in which I described a bunch of the old Kings and all I wrote about Bobby was that he didn't get around like he used to. And then I got a text from you of all people <laughs> saying that I had called Bobby hefty yes or, you know i'm putting it mildly yes yeah so yeah i mean this is i i'm just trying to be self-aware I, I think we have a trend happening here yeah you're you're basically fat shaming me and bobby <laughs> jackson and i mean you're not that you're wrong okay but <laughs> again there's a difference between being the record, i did not call i just said bobby didn't move like he used to that's all it's, it's not inaccurate <laughs> Yeah, but that's like the thing where, um, and I do this as a bit, but if my wife and I are going out for the evening and it's a dress-up affair, and just as we're walking out the door, I say to my wife, hey, are you wearing that tonight? Like, yeah, it's a legit (laughs) question, but there's meaning behind it, Sam. Uh, No, there's not. With you, maybe. Not with Bobby. (laughs) Bobby's good. (laughs) <laughs> Sam Amick of The Athletic, which is an okay website. Go to theathletic.com. There's, there's subscriptions galore. I think actually there's something like a $3 uh, first month deal or, or, or whatever it is. I've been a longtime subscriber, and despite Sam will maintain my subscription, and we'll, uh, we'll tell you more about that towards the end of this interview. Sam, uh, I know it's not mathematically over. I've been uh, going back and forth, uh, having fun with fellow Kings fans who are jumping off the 
playoff bandwagon. But 18 games left. Kings are four behind the Spurs, five behind the Clippers with the tiebreaker. Uh, is it effectively over, in your opinion, for the Kings? What's the tiebreaker breakdown? I'm not aware uh, of that. Right, right now, the Kings own the tiebreaker with the Spurs, and and I think that will hedge on their game in a couple of weeks. They do not own the tiebreaker with the Clippers. So they're five back of the Clippers effectively, four back of the Spurs. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely not good. You know, the Spurs, uh, you know, waking up and winning, I think, four in a row is just pretty devastating for the Kings playoff odds and then you know last night is devastating it's a tough tough loss uh and, and then i'll tell you what just, you know since none of us thought the kings were going to be even worth talking about even on your show this time of year yeah. you know what i mean uh just shout out to the fans who last night yet again I mean, that place is rocking you know i i walked out of there with a bunch of Boston media and in fact might have had a, an adult beverage with some of those guys. That's why I sound so darn tired, mm -hmm. but the, they don't get the Boston reporters. They, they get to Sacramento once a year. And, and some of them, it was, you know, the first time they had been in that arena. And uh, it was interesting to hear the feedback where people were like, man, that place was just, you know, unreal, which is saying something Boston, you know, people know how to do it when it comes to home games. But, yeah, I think they're in trouble, you know, for sure. Um, I do anticipate that they'll keep pushing. It's definitely not over, but that tiebreaker not having it against the Clippers certainly hurts. Um, and I don't know what to make of the Spurs, you know, if they're going to keep going down this road or be the team that was scuffling before them. Well, they play the Spurs. In fact, it, you know, I was just looking. They will own the tiebreaker versus the Spurs. I should have known that. They play them once more in San Antonio March 31st. They've played them twice at home. Uh, beating them both times, and they only play the Spurs three times this year. So they will win that tiebreaker, uh, two out of three. Yeah, it, it is a tough road. And obviously Marvin Bagley uh, going down uh, for a couple now different long stretches uh, it doesn't, doesn't help matters. Uh, at the same time, who knows, and that's what I've been saying. They've got a, The schedule opens up a little bit over the next couple weeks. But either way, Sam, um, I don't know if the Kings are the biggest surprise in the NBA. Uh, and I don't want to sound like uh, I'm giving up here, but no matter what happens, uh, I'm pretty sure Kings fans can hold their heads high that they're definitely probably at least in the top five biggest surprises of the year. Yeah, for sure. In fact, I, I don't know if you heard that Brad Stevens uh, before, or maybe after the game, I forget when, last night the Celtics coach went out of his way to give yep. Jaeger some praise and say that, I don't know if he said he should be coach of the year, but he's definitely in the discussion. Uh, and so, again, some of the locals who know Brad's habits made the point that that's just not something he typically does in terms of kind of stumping for another coach. Sure. So that got my attention. Uh, the Bagley injury definitely hurts. And, you know, I heard the caller before I came on talking about late game stuff. And, I mean, it's true. They have had a handful of just late game situations that haven't gone their way, quite a few, you know, and this one. I'd have to go watch the replay again, but it's like, you know, Harrison uh, just didn't exact, didn't break free, didn't, didn't get a, a good look. I mean, you're right about, you know, shots fall or they don't, but, you know, they uh, I don't think they got the look they wanted. So they're in a tough spot. Fair to say with this team, uh, and, and I don't really like doing post-mortem with 18 games left, fair to say with this team, I, I don't know that I necessarily want to compare them to Denver from last year, uh, but, but this is just – when, when you're doing the post-mortem on the Kings, uh, they're just not ready. They're just not there. They're just too young. Yeah. Uh, yes, that is a big part of it. Um, you do see, I, I was telling somebody last night, I mean, that's just, you see young teams like this, like, like look at Denver, for example. Yeah. You know, you're talking two years in a row where they missed the playoffs by a hair. And, you know, last year, I believe it was an overtime game on the last you know game of the year that was deciding things with Minnesota. So similar theme, similar strain. Uh, I think, you know, it's going to, if it keeps going this direction, it's certainly, it's going to hurt that group even more than normal maybe because it was, it was really cool to see like how the young guys actually cared about the history and that idea of breaking the, the streak of, you know, no playoffs going back to 2006. And I mean, that's the one where, okay, super fun year, but that, you know, that is 
again, if this is where it ends up, that's unfortunate because that's just that's just a monstrous like elephant in the room type streak. You know what I mean? Like you don't want to be the league's longest anything of, of a negative type, and, and you know and that would still be there. But yeah, this is definitely normal stuff when it comes to figuring those situations out. Sam Amick of the Athletic with us. Sam, we spent a lot of time yesterday uh, on on the Lakers and uh, LeBron James, uh, talking about how much I've noticed Luke Walton is a horrible coach and. Uh, LeBron James is washed up. I feel like Magic Johnson's escaping a lot of the, a lot of the uh, uh, the scrutiny here. Not totally, but probably third on that list. Do you think that's right? You, Nobody, you've done a tremendous job over the last year plus with Jeannie Buss and your access, doing deep dives on the Lakers. I feel like Magic deserves more blame than he's getting. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. I mean, you must you must be right because I keep getting that question. Um, I feel like, you know, I've and in, in what I've written about the Lakers situation that you know, I've highlighted the fact that Magic and Rob both. I mean, to me, you know, in my criticism, it's been number one. It's been Magic and Rob together, right? Um, and it's just that idea that they. You know, I don't know what in the world they were thinking in terms of not prioritizing shooting. Yep. You know, that's the incredible thing. It's, uh, and, and honestly, like even internally, um, well, I don't know, this is kind of harmless enough to share, like, as you would assume, like, sure, like, all, you know, in these interviews I've done with Jeannie, you end up talking offline a little bit. And it's like, you can tell that the shooting is an internal concern all season long. And I'm looking at it like, okay, but it's not complicated to figure out you know, how this went down. You know, it's like I, the, LeBron's entire career, you surround him with shooters, and that's the formula. Yep. And they went out. I mean, I saw a number yesterday, not to digress, but Tom Haverstro of NBC has a, a segment that he calls the big number, and he pulled up the fact that LeBron and Rondo have a minus 55 together this season on the floor Jeez. every other player in the Lakers is in the plus when he's on the floor with LeBron and you know that's the, the reality is you cannot score with Rondo and LeBron on the floor together because Rondo's not a shooter LeBron's you know gotten better over his career but uh, I mean you get the point like the roster construction just lent itself to this year they're having and uh, and I agree I think Magic deserves a lot of that blame well that's that's where it really floors me. We talked about it before the year started, and, and I said it was almost like Magic was pledging a fraternity or being on a dare or something, he and Rob, because you sign Rondo. You already have the LeVar Lonzo ball dynamic, and you bring in Rondo, JaVale, Lance, Stevenson, Michael Beasley. How is it not going to happen this way? To me, that that is just flat-out malpractice on the part of building a roster or did they just somehow think maybe in the back of their heads they don't want to say it publicly that this year was a, a complete and total wash I can't buy that it wasn't a wash. I mean they they definitely wanted to compete in the playoffs you know it wasn't a wash on that front at all and you know to a degree they can make the argument that they wanted to preserve their cap space for this summer but there were other guys you could give one year contracts to right. um you know, and the biggest one that doesn't make sense is Brooke Lopez. You know, you gave your money to Contavious Caldwell Pope, which ironically he can shoot a little bit. Yeah. But you know, but Brooke Lopez not only shoots, but he's a hell of a defensive presence, doing some pretty good things for the Bucks this year. Um, you know, that's a a major loss. Julius Randle's a good player. You know, um, again, not a shooter, but these. I mean, I actually I wonder in the weeks ahead. A, fine, let's say Luke gets fired. This is the responsible reporter in me does feel like throwing in there, like, never say never. We thought Eric Spolster was going to get fired sure. in Miami. Sure, um, I mean, in my intel that I haven't even shared publicly because it just seems like it's so against the narrative is, like, definitely being told by somebody who would definitely know that not a foregone conclusion on okay. Luke. Okay. Um, but – I just it, I hate to say it, I just don't know if I believe that. There's a lot of people in that room, but we'll see. Um, but I also wonder about Rob. Like, if anybody was going to be in trouble here, I could see a scenario where, 
like Matt, just Magic's not going to lose his job. Like, right. come on, right? You it's know, magic. Um, yeah, it's Magic. So yeah, screwed me. Fine. I wonder if you know there's maybe a little more heat on Rob. Sam Amick joining us from the Athletic as we wrap up. Uh, going uh, into Northern California, we'll stay all in California here. Um, is Demarcus Cousins as much of a pull on their defense as being as is being made out? Draymond Green jumped to his defense that he wasn't the reason. Uh, but you see Andrew Bogut signing. Was that a signal uh, from the front office from Steve Kerr that uh, they've only got a few more games in the Cousins experiment and things might change come playoff time? What? What? How did you read that? No, I don't think it's that extreme by any means. Um, first of all, like, I think when it comes to locker room dynamics, I, it feels like that was, you know, them and partly Steve Kerr kind of clutching on to something familiar. You know, Bogut was part of their group during a very special time. Uh, I heard Tim Calacami, my, my colleague at The Athletic, who covers the Warriors and does such a good job talking about how like, you know, Bogut and Draymond Green back in the day, they had such a special chemistry defensively on the floor. And so I think it's a it's a it's a kind of a reflection of the overall defensive concerns. I think they're sixteenth in defensive rating, which is not kind of, you know, championship level. Uh I, I'm curious to see I don't you know, we'll have to wait and see how the rotations look. I don't know I mean, Cousins is still clearly the priority in terms of rotations. And maybe Bogut ends up being a deep bench guy. I just also know Andrew well enough. I just the combination of how much money he's getting and the fact that he decided to cross the pond and kind of interrupt his life again to come back to the NBA like this. I, I'm just assuming he wouldn't do that if he wasn't going to have a somewhat impactful role. Right. But you know, that I'm curious to see how that pans out. That's Sam Amick of The Athletic. Just go to theathletic.com. It's the best sports coverage there is. Support great journalism, and they've got phenomenal deals for you. A month subscription is going to cost you less than a drink at the bar. It's going to make you a lot smarter uh, when you're done. Sam, uh, what do you have and or what do you have coming up on The Athletic? Uh, today, I haven't written in a few days, so I, I get excited when I actually publish stories these days. I write less frequently. Uh, Must be nice. I finally wrote that. Well, I mean, but we do do, you know, we go a little, I said do-do. Oh, you do. that, Dave? Oh, you did. Yeah, Got that's it. my kids in my head. Yes, yep. it is. Uh, <laughs> I wrote about the Bucks, and they were in town last week, and uh, did a longer read on the fact that, A, are they really legit, and could they win the whole darn thing? And then, B, in the context, this is a longer chat, I'll let you run, but, like, with Adam Silver highlighting how, players are so unhappy and with so many teams like the Warriors and Celtics and Lakers seemingly not always enjoying each other's company. Um, the Bucks are like a big love affair fraternity. So I think that's going to help them in the next few months. You see that mature adults getting through tumultuous times, despite the fact that conversations and insults flew behind the back that Sam Amick and myself, <laughs> a lovely couple indeed that will endure our friendship for many, many more years to come. Sam, you're, you're the best. I'll uh, talk to you next week, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you. Take care. That is Sam. You're listening to The Drive.